In part four of lecture two, we will discuss protecting the computer's resources. Early computers were used by one person at a time, and there was no operating system, so there was no major problem if the contents of memory were corrupted. Whatever software there was would be reloaded into the computer. But as operating systems developed and certain functions were routinely assigned to them, the need to protect the user from his or her own mistakes became apparent. And as multiprogramming became a regular feature, the need for protection became imperative. Without some form of protection, programs could easily interfere with each other as much by accident as by design. There are two types of operations that computer systems do. User operations, where they are performing the tasks that users have programmed them to do, and systems operations, where they are performing the tasks that enable users to do the things that they want to do. When a user program is running, it can't be allowed complete unrestricted access to the computer's resources. If user programs were to do this, they could overwrite memory belonging to other programs, overwrite other people's files, and corrupt the data stored on the system. And this can be done by accident very easily. But the operating system needs this kind of access to systems resources, and the computer needs to be able to distinguish between when user programs are doing things that they shouldn't and when the operating system is doing its job. Computers use a mode bit to determine which mode of operation the computer is using. User mode, where the user is restricted from certain activities, or supervisor mode, where the operating system is allowed access to all the computer's resources. Most computer systems restrict access to certain instructions that are needed for systems-related activity, such as accessing input-output instructions, accessing parts of memory that belong to the operating system or to other jobs, and so on. Because these instructions require operating system privileges, we call them privileged instructions. They are available for use during supervisor mode only. As a result, certain jobs can be done only by the operating system, such as input-output. User programs are required to ask the operating system to do these jobs for them. What if there is no dual mode? This was the case for the early Intel processors, which were originally designed for embedded systems such as calculators. No one expected then that these devices would be used as the basis for building small computers. This was at least part of the reason why MS-DOS did not have any of the protections that we normally assume that operating systems will provide. As a result, any and all of the operating system could be overwritten and user programs could, if their programmers wish to have them do so, perform input and output directly. This was not usually a good idea. It made it virtually impossible to implement multitasking operating systems on these machines and made it possible to write computer viruses, a phenomenon that has never been found on mainframe computers. It is worth noting that all the Intel processors since the 286 have provided dual mode operation. There are many ways in which memory protection can be implemented. The simplest way to implement memory protection on a single user computer would be to use a fence register that stores the lowest address that can be accessed by an application program. Every address reference made 
by application programs would be checked to see if they were higher or lower than this address. If they were higher, the instruction would be carried out. If they were lower, it would cause a memory fault or memory violation. If we extend this to multitasking systems, we would need a second register which would indicate how many bytes of memory were allotted to this program. This, in conjunction with the base register, would tell us the range of addresses available to the program. Every time an instruction makes an address reference, the address would be checked by the hardware's address protection. First it would be checked to ensure that the address is greater than or equal to the base address. Then it would be checked against the sum of the base register and limit register to ensure that it is less than that value. Only after passing these two tests would it be able to access memory. If either of these tests fail, it would be a memory violation. Everyone who has written a program knows that it is entirely possible to write an infinite loop and that these are usually done by accident not by design. But the effect is the same. How can you keep the computer from being locked up by one careless program? Computers have clocks built in which tick X number of times each second. The operating system counts the number of ticks and when the program has used up its allotted time it is bounced out of the CPU. This same clock allows the computer to keep track of the time of day and the date as well. Interactive operating systems give each terminal a certain amount of processor time and then move on to the next terminal. Generally, each terminal has the same fixed amount of time, what we call a time slice the length of a time slice will vary from one system to another, but each terminal on a given system will be given the same time slice. At the end of each time slice, the operating system will take over and use the opportunity to perform miscellaneous housekeeping chores before attending to the next terminal. Input and Output are performed by the operating system for user programs. This slide shows an example of how an application program asks the operating system to display a message on the screen. MS-DOS will have several functions associated with a given interrupt. The function number is stored in the AH register. The high end of the AX register and the messages offset is loaded in the DX register. After this, control is transferred to DOS and DOS performs all the necessary steps in displaying the message on the screen. 